Good morning. We are starting with the chapter 6 of the organizational behavior mm. session. Chapter 6 is on attitudes. Here in this chapter, we will come to know about our, the, the understanding of the nature of attitudes, functions of attitudes and changing of attitudes. The, what are the nature of employee attitudes like job satisfaction, job involvement, organizational commitment, emotions, work moods, employee engagement. We will get an overview of emotional intelligence. We will study effects of employee attitudes on changing employee attitudes. We will get an understanding of the nature of values, differences and similarity with the values and attitudes to gain an understanding of societal values, cross-cultural values, organizational values, personal values and work values. The whole discussion on attitudes will be spread through three lectures and in the first lecture we will get an overview of the attitudes, its functions and changing nature and uh, changes of attitude, its effect on behavior and vice versa. What is an attitude? Attitudes are learned predispositions and represent a cluster of beliefs, assessed feelings and behavioral intentions towards aspects of person, aspects like a person, object or an event. So, if you just go through this definition, what is an attitude? First is attitude is a predisposition, it is a learned predisposition and it represents a cluster, it is a conglomerate, it is a cluster of beliefs, feelings and behavioral intentions and so it, it consists both cognitive, affective and cognitive part. And attitude is always towards something, attitude is always towards an either attitude is having always having an attitude object, it can be a person, it can be object, it can be event or any other things present in the environment, it, it could be uh, inanimate things, it's, it could be living beings also. So, and next point is attitudes are, are attitudes are um, evaluative statements. So, as the attitudes are always have your views, it is a judgmental thing about it is either favorable or unfavorable concerning objects, people or events and it, it tells about a persistent tendency. So, attitudes it is a defining is it is a persistent tendency to act, feel and act in a certain particular way towards a certain person, event or a object. So, first attitude it is it is a predisposition, attitude is learned, it is having a um, positive or negative feeling towards certain objects, people or things and it is persistent in um, nature and um, these are the, these are beliefs then the attitudes is a combination of beliefs, feelings and behavior intentions. All these things together define what, what is an attitude because attitude is a learned predisposition and it is uh, having a judgmental or evaluative aspect of positive either positive and negative and it is persistent in nature. These characteristics of attitude makes it so much very important in the field of organizational behavior because it affects the, your behavior, how you behave in the organization and behavior also vice versa affects your attitude. We will come to know about that part in a 
in the next few slides that we are going to discuss over here. <coughs> Recent research suggests that attitudes significantly predict behaviors when moderating variables are taken into account. So, when, what we have discussed is attitude is a behavior intention, it is not the behavior per se, but it is an intention to behave in certain way. So, that attitudes will significantly predict behavior when certain moderating variables are taken into consideration like importance of the attitude to that person, specificity of the attitude, whether the attitude is very specific and could be connected to certain behavior pattern or it's a, it's, it, it does not have that behavioral outcome. Accessibility of the attitude, whether we can access that attitude now and then in the organization, social pressures on the individual while we are trying to access that attitude direct experience with the attitude like whether we have seen others performing it in the same way or not. So, these are some of the moderating variables which if taken into account can significantly predict the attitudes can significantly predict the behavior. The three components of attitudes are first of course, is the belief part which, which is the established perception about the attitude object. These beliefs develop from past experience and learning. Feelings are the positive or the negative evaluation about the attitude object and behavioral intentions are motivations to engage in a particular behavior with respect to the attitude object. Now, formation of attitude takes place through um, various sources. First is of course, direct experience um, with the object like if you um, attitudes can develop from a rewarding or a punishing experience with an object, then you do certain things and you get punished for it or you get praised for it, you try to repeat that attitude and as a result it develops. Classical conditioning people develop association between various objects and various reactions that accompany them. Um, so, you develop certain special feelings positives or negatives to certain people, to certain objects and you try to attach your emotions to it. Apparent conditioning attitudes are reinforced either verbally or non-verbally and tend to be maintained which leads to your direct experience. Vicarious learning where person learns something by observation of others like um, when you are not able, when the person is not able to have a first hand experience with the attitude, observing others um, with that attitude and the outcome they are facing as a result of it. Uh, so, outcome of those attitudes help them to learn those attitudes and that process is called process of vicarious learning. Formation of attitude is influenced by the family first and foremost is the family as we discussed in earlier sessions also family plays a very very important role in development of the personality pattern, development of attitude. So, in, by learning from your family members you get to know um, like what is the attitude uh, through process of vicarious learning or through direct experience when you get rewarded or punished for certain attitudes within the family, then it plays a major role in it. Next is of course, the neighborhood 
where in neighborhood what happens the as others are present so neighborhood sometimes um, praises certain behavior and sometimes it um, doesn't praise certain behavior as a result you get a feedback of what is what attitude you should continue and what it is that you should not continue with the this type of um, thing this type of attitude plays uh, this in this way neighborhood plays a major role in your attitude formation then economic status and occupation of the person in economic station status and occupation of the person what happens your economic status and occupation allows you to nurture certain attitude or doesn't allow you to nurture certain attitude so in that case economic status plays a very important role mass communication in like the newspapers the radio channels the advertisements that you see in the tv all these things help to develop attitudes because they project they tell about certain attitudes of a certain age group and people try to learn by hearing or observing those things in the tv or radio and the, or by reading things in the newspapers so all these are possible sources of learning of attitudes attitudes have certain functions for the individuals first of course is utilitarian attitudes are formed because either the attitude or the attitude object is helpful is instrumental in helping the individual to gain a reward or avoid punishment so at first a function of attitude is of course utilitarian in nature next is ego defense function people form certain attitudes to defend their self image to enhance their self image that is called ego defense function of attitude value expressive functions attitudes represent value system all people share a set of personal values predispositions that they believe strong beliefs that they have and attitudes help us to express those values knowledge functions attitude often is substituted for knowledge so what happens if we are not having a very first hand knowledge about certain objects so attitudes in the like specifically stereotypes that you are having about um, certain person or object helps us to act in certain ways towards a person or a object that or or event so in attitude helps to substitute knowledge it's often so like in the absence of knowledge attitude is used to organize and make sense of the perceived object so suppose you are meeting a person for the first time and from you do not know the details of the person per se his perception his motivation his personality pattern or um, certain other things which defines the individuality of that person but you come to know like this person belongs to a certain maybe um, culture group or a uh, particular that person is in certain occupation so what you do based on your previous knowledge predisposed learn like it's a predetermined a predisposed knowledge about um, that particular occupation and how people of that particular occupation of, or um, that particular um, culture 
generally behave. So what you, with that template, you try to interact with this new person that you are meeting for the first time. So what happens, though you are not having a first hand knowledge, one to one knowledge about the individual person per se, based on your attitudes that you are having about that particular group or occupation people in that particular occupation, drawing cues from that, you are trying to interact with this new person that you are meeting for the first time and it helps as a substitute of your knowledge. Do attitudes predict behavior? It is not always true, people's expressed attitudes often do not predict their behaviors. When do attitudes predict behavior is when the social influences on our attitudes are minimized, when attitude especially relevant to the observed behavior, the stronger an attitude the more likely it will predict behavior. So while, while we are talking of like do attitudes predict behavior. Uh, so like we may tell like it's smoking is um, harmful uh, for health or um, so we see it so but when asked a chain smoker is asked like do you want to quit the the act of quitting is sometimes you is what you don't see so though though they may know they may have the attitude okay it's harmful for health while while asked for quitting that there is a gap between that attitude that the person um, has and the actual act out when you talk of practicing it in behavior so there is a when it is a behavior intention and actual behavior you find the gap in that so, when really attitude predicts behavior is when social influences are minimized. So, in some you have like um, light leave sort of a, you know, happy and light leave sort of attitude towards your life and when the social influence on it is minimized, you practice it in your behavior like happy go lucky sort of behavior. So, um, when attitude again is specifically relevant to the observed behavior uh, or, or when the stronger the attitude, it will, if, if you have very strong attitude, you, if you strongly believe in certain things, then maybe you try to practice that thing also. Like if you strongly, if you are st strongly believe like environment is to be protected and you feel for the environment and its protection, then what you do is maybe you join a group with like Greenpeace and other things which actively um, practices or, uh, envi environmental protection. Um, projects and all these things so that whatever you share as an attitude, whatever you believe you strongly have an attitude towards, you can practice it in reality and in that case it your attitude will predict your behavior. Attitudes gain strength, increase in potency. Um, if we think of our attitudes before we are acting, so if you are practicing it before you are acting it out, if you are thinking about what are your likely attitudes, you can like it increases in potency. It, it, you become self conscious about your attitudes, so it, then it becomes strong. And if your attitude is gained through experience also, 
then these attitudes are more stronger in nature. Next opposite thing is do our behaviors influence our attitudes about things? Yes, it is true like why because what happens these are two things like we have mentioned about here is role playing and foot in the door phenomena is role playing while trying to act out um, certain roles then what happens here you do the role demands certain type of behavior and attitudes and as a part of playing that role you start developing and showing that attitude and they, they, there is a great experiment done on the prisoners and the jailers when the roles are reversed it was found that the like the jailers were originally when the jailers were there and the prisoners were there the prisoners complained about the tortures and the torments done to them uh, by the jailers but when there was a role reversal that is the jailers were played the role of the prisoners and the prisoners played the role of the jailers the jailers also the prisoners who were now playing the role of the jailers were acting in the similar fashion like that of the jailers like the similar torturing and tormenting roles um, attitudes so it, it it was seen like the role reversal role playing developed certain attitudes in the um, people next is the technique which is called foot in the door phenomena like you know, a certain part of the behavior small you take small small um, steps towards developing certain attitude small, by small step like you can change an attitude from no to yes which is sometimes used by the salesmen like when they come to sell you certain things what happens they first ring the bell at the your home and you tell okay i don't want to buy this product because i don't have time or i have plenty or whatever reason so what they will maybe they they try to do is give give me two minutes time so that i can explain about the utility of this product and certain things that two minutes is very crucial for the sales person and if he is efficient enough smart enough he can change that negative attitude towards buying that particular product which was no to a situation where the person the buys the product and it becomes yes so that is the foot in the door technique like by small steps increasingly small steps you try to generally change gradually change the attitudes and in that way the behavior influences attitude what explains why behavior shape or attitudes are first is of course self presentation theory second is cognitive dissonance theory third is self perception theory in self presentation theory what happens we match our attitudes with our actions to appear favorable to others we adjust um, to say to appear pleasant and to avoid offending others so this this is utilized in the uh, foot in the door technique so so to maintain our self image we sometimes we cannot say no and we go on yielding and saying yes to what the stimuli from the environment is telling us to do and we try to match our attitude 
with our action. Action is we give time or we try to appear courteous and give time to the salesperson okay, two minutes to explain and generally in order to appear in the same way like we are favorable and courteous, we go on yielding and generally that is to match our attitude with our action in order to appear pleasant and to avoid offending others. Sometimes we our attitude changes from total no to total yes. Cognitive dissonance theory, tension arises when you are aware of two simultaneous inconsistent cognitions. To reduce the dissonance, we change your attitudes so that they will correspond to our actions. We correct discrepancies between attitudes and behaviors. We often experience dissonance when making big decisions. To reduce the dissonance after making our choice, we upgrade the chosen alternative and downgrade the unchosen option. So, what happens like in this situation, if we, if you are having two thought processes which are conflicting in nature and then what happens, we are having a dissonance in our mind, a disturbing situations in our mind. So, what we do? We try to correct the discrepancies between our um, attitudes and the um, behavior which, which may be done in both positive and the um, like negative senses and we then after that when we often experience um, like we, after reducing that gap what we do we upgrade the chosen alternative and downgrade the not chosen alternative things could be like may sometimes making um, ethical um, decisions in the uh, cognitive dissonance may arise while making um, decisions in the organization uh, concerning the areas of ethics also like um, we know like it is um, wrong to tell a lie it is good to be honest and um, you should not bribe a person, all these things are um, there, values practiced by the organization and person and values that you believe in. Now, if you have to bribe a person um, to get certain orders for your company, um, so what do you do? Then there, there will be a cognitive uh, you have an attitude like it is very wrong to bribe a person, it is good to be honest, you never tell a lie sort of attitudes and then you, you are the person who becomes, who is, in, who, who is instrumental in uh, rather um, who has to uh, pay the um, bribe and to get certain things done um, for your company then what happens this dissonance starts and there is a dis, um, this there appears a discrepancy between your attitudes and your um, behavior what you believe in and what you uh, feel good and bad about and your the behavior so reduced in order to reduce this discrepancy what you try to do is first you try to correct the discrepancy between the um, attitudes and behaviors. Either you do not pay the bribe because you support your attitude too much or you change your attitude to certain extent um, to reduce the gap between the behavior and attitude by framing a concept um, like um, it is yeah it is not good to pay a bribe. But in such in situations amounting to this, 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 if this is the context, then it is and you have to do it, 
then maybe this is permissible. It, it all depends on how you frame it and um, how you um, are like um, how you are reducing the gap um, either either by um, uh, changing your alternatives or or reframing re rephrasing your um, alternatives that you are having but anyways the thing is to uh, reduce the dissonance the mental dissonance the cognitive dissonance that you are facing regarding this um, discrepancy between your attitude and the um, your behaviors and in every big decision that you take about your organization you have to generally this cognitive dissonance occurs like you, you generally like you generally employ friendly organization but what about when the decision you, you have to take regarding like you have to part with certain so some of your employees who who according to your present situations the business situations that you're in you feel like are no more required for you so do you feel a dissonance over here do you like sense uh, have a feeling of, of a dissonance a cognitive dissonance appearing between the behavior that you are about to do about to act out and the and your attitude towards your employees so this is one of the examples these type of dissonance these type cognitive dissonance occurs while you are taking your major decisions in the organization and then you have to reduce that dissonance based on certain reasons that you frame for yourself and then whether you upgrade the alternative that you choose and then give more importance and highlight on the alternative that you choose and downgrade the other unchosen options. Self perception theory is um, when you are unsure about your attitudes what you do um, you examine your behavior and the circumstances under which it occurs. So, Mm -hmm. This is an experiment where Wells and Petty had subjects test headphone sets by making either vertical and um, horizontal head movements while listening to radio editorial. So, what happened? Those who were nodding their heads up and down agreed with the editorial most, and it is associated with yes response. So, what happens like when you are testing the head, this particular body movements of moving nodding the head in a position which generally is the accepted way of telling yes like moving your heads up and down is by developing that attitude you just try to by developing that physical behavior you try to form an attitude of yes towards the editorial response. So, that, that is where um, the behaviors and um, circumstances under which it is occurring helps you develop your attitudes. So, One of the major factors again for changing attitudes is communication and persuasive communication. So, persuasive communication is a communication which is aimed at changing people's attitudes and it is whether the persuasive communication is successful or not it depends on um, several factors. First is of course, the a source from where that persuasion is being done and then it depends on the communicator and thirdly on the message. Then source affects what attention, comprehension and yielding 
of the communication. So, sources which are credible sources helps in internalization of the message. So, if you are having uh, some persuasive message from a credible source, then you get to listen to it and internalize it. Attractiveness of the source helps in identification of the recipient with the source of the message and power of the source helps in your like ap accepting it, complying to it. So, to be an effective communicator must have credibility um, based on his or her expertise perceived knowledge of the topic and also to be considered trustworthy. So, attractiveness of the source depends on the similarity of the source, familiarity and liking. So, the greater the similarity between the audience and the communicator, the better will be the like, that communication gets accepted and its greater effectiveness is there. So, in certain cases what happens like peer group learning is it becomes more effective more effective while changing while trying to change the attitude of people because if the outsiders come and tell you um, like ok you go and change this attitude or this is the outcome of your attitude people sometimes do not um, take it because the uh, familiarity of the source, the attractiveness or the like the similarity factor is not there, but when people who have who are of the same group, who have gone through the same experience, um, shares their feelings, shares um, tells you to change certain attitudes, sometimes it works like that we take in peer group technique in counseling, group counseling, uh, especially to change attitudes towards uh, like um, drug, ad um, like smoking, drinking or um, drug addictions, all these things where, um, where people who have similarly undergone through those therapy sessions those rehabilitations, when they come and share about their experiences, it becomes more effective rather than a counsellor um, sharing it or telling them to change their attitudes. So, power again of the source can be of three types, power of sanction of positive compliance and uh, scrutiny, like if the, if somebody has the power to reward you or to punish you, then your attitudes, then the, then attitudes are some like are prone to more change because you know if I am not carrying out the order given by this source or I am not complying to the request made by this source to change my attitude sort of then uh, because this in power dynamics this person is much higher than where I am in the organization, maybe I will not get the reward or I may get punished for it. Mm. So, the way the message is presented is also very important like the whether it presents both sides of the argument or not. So, whether it is reaching a conclusion explicit or implicit conclusion. So, whether it message provokes fear or not and whether it is making its strongest argument first or last all these determines the attractiveness of the message and the effectiveness of the message. So, but all said and done, if the same person is communicating to two different groups, it, it 
may it may be possible that the attitude of one group is been influenced by the attitudes of the other group is not getting influenced because again there are individual differences factors like age sex intelligence and uh, these are audience variables which may affect the attitude change whatever be the nature of the source communicator and the nature of the message but audience variables are also responsible for understanding whether an attitude gets changed or not like many studies have found that um, women are more susceptible to uh, persuasion than uh, men because um, it is culturally um, determined like sometimes the argument is that it is culturally determined that women uh, have greater pressure to feel to conform to others opinions and expectations or um, or rather women have uh, superior verbal skills um, to which makes their ability to understand and process verbal arg arguments in a much better way so that so they can comprehend in a better way what the message is all about what it asks to change what it wants to comply with and as a result attitudes are changing the effect of intelligence on attitude change is inconclusive so because more intelligent one is so that will with he or she can try to look into different aspects of uh, the same thing before trying to change it it becomes less easily persuaded because he can he or she can detect the weakness in the other person's argument however there is a direct link between self esteem and attitude change um, so people with um, high self esteem are um, too strong in their self esteem to be persuaded to change while people with low self esteem are not attentive enough to Um, absorb the persuasive message so people with moderate self esteem are those who are likely to be attending to persuasive messages and who are more prone to change their minds so like persuasive messages are in face to face communication it becomes more effective because you can explain facts which um, you can monitor their behavior try to see how the other person is uh, reacting to what you are telling and then you can monitor your own behavior and the ways you address the other people and it becomes much better as a mode of communication while you are trying to persuade other person as compared to mass communication mm, so mm, then the effects of persuasion mm, like it could be like direct effect or it may be a slipper effect while while it is showing after a certain point of time mm. and also there is no surety like once you have changed your attitude means it will be remaining changed for the ne next part of their life people may revert back to their old attitudes when the situation the environment supports the initial one so there could be change changes are there but stability of that change or again it will revert back to the original situations or not will depend again on environmental factors and other supportive factors present around so maguire suggested like the information processing model of persuasion 
where in order to change listener's attitude, he must capture the attention, the listener must comprehend the message and then he may lead, yield to the argument and then retain it until there is an opportunity for action which is the final step in the attitude change to make it sure like there is a change in attitude that person needs to act it out you know that is the changed attitude because and link it with the change behavior. So, all these are information processing model of uh, persuasion. Barriers to attitude change are like prior commitments that you are having like what is like your psychological investment in the earlier attitudes that you your your values and earlier attitudes that you are having. If you are having insufficient information about the new expected attitude then how to do it, what is the source and how it is communicated to you then these may act as barriers to changing your attitude. So, overcoming these barriers is possible by providing new information, more detailed information about the newer alternatives, benefits of it over the older alternatives, all these things. Then sometimes use of fear if the source is powerful enough and has the capacity of rewarding and punishing, then use of fear may help to change the attitude. The friends and peers are even important influencers in changing attitude, then co-opting approach whether you co-opt, you decide to co-opt for changing that attitude. And attitude change can be of two types like um, congruent change where, where the you move in the same direction, what of the original attitude what you do is it changes from suppose from positive to more positive. Incongruent change is change in the direction of attitude itself that is from change you change from a negative attitude to a positive attitude. Congruent attitude is one you, you remain in the same direction, the degree of it becomes more intense or lesser, um, posit, more positive or less negative. Uh, but while you are talking of incongruent change from positive you change to negative or from negative to you change to positive. So, effect of attitude on behavior is that attitudes have influence on the perception and behavior of the individuals um, and they affect behavior uh, through the cognitive dissonance and self-fulfilling prophecy. The theory of reasoned action developed by Fishbane and Azen, they deal with the study of attitude and behavior. The key application of this theory is prediction of behavior intention and spanning of attitude and predictions of behavior. The subsequent separation of behavioral intention from behavior allows for explanation of limiting factors on attitudinal influence. So, the components are like three components which are like behavioral intention, attitude and subjective norm. Um, so, suppose you want to go for a new exercise program uh, as example given by Miller in 2005. So, attitude is a sum of beliefs about a particular behavior weighted by evaluations of these beliefs. So, what you may believe in that exercise is good for health, it makes you look good, it takes too much of time and that exercise is uncomfortable. Each of these beliefs can be weighted like health issues are more important to you than the looks and the issues of time and comfort. Subjective norms, it looks at the influence of people in one's social environment on his or her behavioral intentions, the beliefs of people weighted by the importance one attributes to each of their opinions, 
will influence one's behavior intention. So, example given over here is that there could be some friends who are good exercisers and they will encourage you to join them. However, your spouse might prefer a more sedentary lifestyle and does not want to work out. So, the beliefs of these people along with the weightage that you put to their beliefs, the more important these people are to you. So, who is more important and whose opinion is more important to you, it will influence your behavioral intention to exercise. So, which will lead to your behavior to exercise or not to exercise. Behavioral intention is a function of both attitude towards the behavior and the subjective norms towards the behavior. So, which will predict the actual behavior. So, uh, your attitude to exercise will be combined with the subjective norms about exercise with each with their own weights will lead you to intention to exercise or not to do it then which will lead to your actual behavior. Mm -hmm. According to Triandis, perceived consequence of an action affect evoked by the action and social factors influence behavioral intentions. So, this can be simply represented by behavioral intention is a um, sum of like one's attitudes um, towards performing the behavior and the derived weights for it and the social sum your subjective norm related to performing that behavior and the weightage um, that attached to it. Shefford in 1988 told that there are three limiting conditions on the use of attitudes and subjective norms to predict intentions and the use of intentions to predict performance of behavior. These are the goals versus behavior. Distinction between a goal intention like an ultimate accomplishment of losing 10 pounds and a behavioral intention like I will take a diet peel and try to get instant like sort of low loss of weight. Mm. So, what you can do you, you can lose your weight by either exercise or by taking a diet peel. So, what there is a difference between your goal intention and the behavioral intention the choice among alternatives. So, the presence of um, more choices may dramatically change the nature of intentions process and the role of intention in the performance of the um, behavior. So, if more alternatives are present to you, you may find out like what you are trying to do the behavioral intention, goal intention and how to reach that goal through what type of behavior all these number of choices may determine it. Intentions versus estimates, there are clearly times in what one intends to do and what one expects to do are quite different. So, I may intend to do so many things on earth, but what I can really expect to do based on the constraints that I am within the situational constraint are sometimes quite um, different. So, one actually so, expect so there is a there is a difference between these two things. So, beliefs and evaluation of behavioral outcomes may define attitude towards the behavior will define behavioral intention again normative beliefs and subjective norms will define behavioral intention and they that will def define the behavior. There has been revision of this theory by Azen himself into the theory of planned behavior. This extension involves the addition of another major factor predictor which is the perceived behavioral control to the model. So, this control factor um, as we are telling like what, what, what is the intention and what we actually expect from ourselves what what actually we can expect 
could be different because due to this reason of perceived behavioral control because we may intend to do so many things but not all part of we cannot control the whole part of the our behavior so many things depend on the situations and the contextual factor the locus of control things that that is in our control things we know that is not in our control and it depend and we are in the calm control of the outside agencies so perceived behavioral control is one of the mechanism which which is translating the intention of behavioral intention into um, expect expectations to behave in certain ways uh, so, because that the actual behavior is thwarted because they lack confidence or control over the behavior. So, the changed model is if you see behavioral beliefs will lead to attitude towards the behavior, normative beliefs is subjective nouns will lead to intention that is to behavior. This, this is the first part of the uh, model that we saw earlier. Uh, added portion is of course this control of beliefs and perceived behavioral control this will affect your intention and actual behavior because then with this will try to change the intention into the expected behavior and this will act as actual behavioral control because the, the intention while getting translated into behavior is just influenced by this perceived behavioral control and my belief about how much I can control my behavior, whether I am confident that I can change my intention into my actual behavior, all these factors will influence the intention and then it will get translated into the actual behavior. Uh, so, we will continue with um, the session on attitude in the next two lectures based on like what is job satisfaction and what are the other organizational commitment and uh, what is employee engagement and then again we will move to the next session on like um, more details about how these are going to affect the behavior and followed by emotions, moods, emotional intelligence, uh, values in the workplace, personal values, organizational values, how it is affecting the performance and so on. Thank you.